years. Now, I want uh, Sean to introduce himself. Sure. So my name is Sean Bass. I'm an independent consultant based in the Chicago area. And uh, I've known Benny for many years, probably going back to 2004, 2005 timeframe. And uh, like Benny, I'm a RDS MVP and a, a Citrix CTP, which is their similar program. And uh, both of us have uh, talked for many years about wanting to come up with a way to accurately depict uh, the various remoting protocols and kind of how they act in various LAN-WAN scenarios. So about two years ago, Benny and I got this idea to start putting together some standardized ways of comparing these protocols. And over the years, we've expanded it and added new protocols and changed the way that we're doing our testing a little bit. So uh, that's what I'd like to share with you today. OK, so let's dive into the agenda. So we're going to show you how uh, user session remoting really works, but it's a level 400 session. So uh, we are not going to uh, introduce you to this technology because we really want to compare the remoting protocols. And so you see the list here? We're going to dive into that uh, in, in just a couple of minutes, uh, why we selected those protocols and, and how they compare. And then we go into particular graphics formats, like 2D graphics, uh, video and animation, 3D graphics. Um, and in the end, we will come up with a summary and showing you uh, what we uh, found out. So as I said, the, the requirements for these sessions are that you know about remote desktop technology. So uh, you should be uh, well aware of what the names mean. And you should have some computer graphics fundamentals, um, meaning that we will not dive into the individual graphics formats, how they really work. We will, we will just uh, assume that you know about the graphics formats, um, and, uh, such as GDI, DirectX, and uh, WPF, and, and all these things. So uh, if, if this is not what you already know. This may be the wrong session for you. So let's go into the uh, user session remoting technologies first. First of all, when you look at a Windows desktop, it's not only one graphics format that is responsible for creating the user interface. It's, um, well, a whole spectrum of different formats. And you see them here. And uh, it, it's like GDI, as I mentioned before. It's also DirectX. It's a lot of video and audio, silver light now, flash that you have as, as the components at the graphics format that create the desktop. And uh, if you look at the remote desktop uh, architecture, it is not a simple architecture, because it requires things that run in system space. It requires things that run in session space for each of the individual user sessions. And it's also that some of the, of the components run in kernel mode, and the other run in uh, user mode. So if you look at the granularity of that architecture, you will, you, will easy, you will simply find out, hey, if you modify this architecture at one particular place, the result may look completely different. And if you look at the remoting protocol stack, Microsoft provides the, the core protocol stack, but it's open enough so that other vendors can plug into it. So you can have third-party extensions to that architecture. And uh, some of the vendors even go beyond that, and they create their own protocol stack that completely circumvents that protocol stack that is provided by Microsoft, which will provide different results when using these technologies. What all these protocols have in common is if you connect from a client to the host that is hosting your desktop, you have a, a negotiation between the two components. So. The client says, hey, look, this is what I can do in hardware or in software because I know about, for example, a graphics format. And so the uh, host can adapt accordingly. In other words, if the client says, you know, I understand GDI calls, the host can send GDI calls directly down the wire, and the client is able to interpret them. Now, if you're working on a Linux client, for example, the Linux client has no idea about GDI. So it will tell the, the host, hey, you have to render pictures before you send them down the wire. And that's a fundamental difference between some of the setups that we, that we made and some of the uh, results that we, that we gathered from and that. And one primary impact of that, as Benny talked about, if you're able to remote GDI primitives down to a client device, this is very, very efficient over the wire, if you're, particularly if you're dealing with a WAN connection. If you can't do GDI primitives and you're falling back to host-side rendering, then you get uh, a bitmap screen scrape, which is uh, 
uh, much more bandwidth on the wire. So this negotiation is very important yep. to deliver an optimal uh, experience. And that doesn't only happen for GDI, it also happens for uh, video formats, for example. So this is why we will be talking a lot about redirection, a lot about rendering. And in order to, to have the same base knowledge, just what is rendering? So Windows writes graphics objects into what is called the device context, and then it is rendered to create the raster image on the output device, which typically is a monitor. So that is what it does, in essence. Now, as uh, Sean pointed out, there is a fundamental difference if things are rendered on the host side or if they are rendered on the client side. Now, let's look into the different technologies. If it's client side rendered, all the graphical objects are created on the host, and then these graphical objects are just sent down the wire. The different graphical objects may use different formats. And uh, then in the end, they are rendered on the client side, which is extremely efficient. But the client needs to understand all those graphics formats natively. So that is a requirement. So during the uh, negotiation handshake, the client must tell the host, you know, I understand all those graphics formats. Just send them down the wire. So just an ex as an example of that, if you wanted to put some text onto a screen, you can send a picture of each character of text down to the client as a bitmap. But the client side rendering will actually send the, the Windows API call for, for painting that object on the screen. And so the actual graphical image itself never gets transferred across the wire, just an API call that is replayed by the client side. But as Benny mentioned earlier, if you're using a Linux device that does not understand GDI or the Windows API, then it has to transfer that as a bitmap image across the wire. So if that doesn't work, if the client does not understand some of the formats, uh, something happens that we call screen scraping. It's not a nice name for it, but in essence, this is what's happening because the rendering of some of the graphics formats happens on the host side. And now you have to scrape all those pixels from the screen, from the virtual screen that lives on the host side, and you send the resulting picture down the wire, which is a lot more expensive when it comes to uh, network bandwidth. So uh, then it's created, then it's uh, presented on the client side, and we have the picture. Uh, but the performance may not be as good as if you do uh, client side rendering. And on the screen scraping specifically, uh, where this really becomes a large problem in terms of the user experience and the bandwidth involved is when the state of the host side system is not still. If you have still imaging and there's very small amounts of movement, then screen scraping is pretty efficient. But when you start having a lot of fast motion movement, screen scraping becomes much, much less efficient. Now we can do another thing that looks like it's screen scraping, but that goes a little bit beyond what we've seen before. Instead of using the CPU to do the screen scraping, we, we, we require help from the hardware that lives on the host side, like the GPU. And that's a technology that is being introduced uh, to us from Microsoft by uh, RemoteFX. And how does that work? So everything is rendered on the host side, and we use the GPU on the host side. So we render, we capture, we compress, we encrypt, and we use as much of the hardware that lives on the host as possible and send this live video stream, because it's nothing more than, like, than an interactive video that is being created, and we send it down the wire, and on the client side, it's decrypted, uncompressed, and displayed, maybe also with the help of hardware that lives on the client. So these are the fundamental difference between uh, the rendering. Now, I want to show you the demo environment that we have here uh, to give you an impression. So what I have here on my laptop is I'm running um, a Hyper-V, and on the Hyper-V box, I'm also running two VMs. One is a Win7 VM. You see that one here is a Win7 VM that we will be using for the demos. And we have another one, which is a um, remote desktop session host uh, session. And uh, the, the difference between the two is that the Win7 session runs with RDP, while the uh, terminal server or, or remote desktop session host session runs with remote effects. This is possible even if I do not have a physical GPU here on my laptop that is supported by, that is, um, supported by remote effects. So I had to configure these things on the remote desktop session host. So if you look into the group policy on this machine, you see I configured remote effects to be enabled 
I optimize the visual experience when using remote effects. And just to show you that I'm really using remote effects, I went to Event Viewer. And you see here that I logged on to this session just before this uh, breakout session started. It's still the German time zone, so do not be confused about the real time up there. But you see that this uh, remote effects session was just created prior uh, to starting this, uh, this breakout session. You see it's 7.11 PM in Germany right now. And so just before this uh, breakout session, I started that. So you have the two now. So I will show you later what the effects are when you're comparing the two and what we did with such a setup. Good, let's go back to the slide deck. Now, what we do is we compare the most popular Windows remoting protocols. So you see a list here, and all those in amber. Uh, these are the protocols that we will be comparing. You see there are more, and there is more work for us to do. So we try to extend that list more and more. So that's the idea. So today you will see Microsoft RDP and remote effects, Citrix HDX, VMware Teradici, the PC over IP uh, protocol in software. You will see the Quest EOP, Iricom Plays, HP, RGS. So these are the protocols that we will be looking at. Another thing that you always have to keep in mind, some of the protocols do lossless compression while others do lossy compression. There's a fundamental difference between the two because lossless compression is very good for high performance graphics environments such as medical imaging, for example. You don't want to have any um, artifacts uh, in your images that are caused by lossy compression. Uh, so you're using a lossless compression algorithm. Typically, it's more expensive on the CPU or GPU side. So you can- And bandwidth. Well. And bandwidth, yes. yeah. And you can, uh, well, also lose, use the lossy compression, which is faster, typically. And, and there's also uh, hybrids of these two. Yeah. So uh, both PC over IP and uh, Citrix HDX have, uh, they, they vary in terminology, but it's basically build to lossless. So they start out as lossy compression, and as bandwidth allows for, they snap to clarity with a lossless image. So uh, it kind of depends on the vendor, but some are offering a hybrid. And what the traditional RDP protocol does, it partially does a host side rendering. For GDI, for example, it does a client side rendering. So it sends all the GDI objects down the wire to the client, and it renders it on the client. While um, the, the old RDP protocol, for example, video rendering was happening on the host side. Only the newer versions of RDP are redirecting video to the client side. But what they also did is they were using lossless compression. So sometimes things were looking really nice, but they were stuttering. They were not so fast when they were using RDP. While Citrix with HDX, Right from the beginning, they were trying to render as much as they could on the client side, redirecting literally all the, 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 the graphics formats on the client, to the client, and they had a lossy compression. But as uh, uh, Sean pointed out, you can co configure that if you want to have a lossy compression or a lossless compression. But that makes a, makes a real big difference between uh, um, when, when, it, when you look at the performance of the- On well, the user system. experience, which is really what we're concerned yeah, about here, so. Absolutely. Now, if you're using remote effects, then everything is rendered on the host side, as I said before. So we're going to take a look at what that's going to be looking like. Now, if we are comparing these protocols, we want to have a test methodology. How did we do it? We have a test lab with uh, physical PCs, which are servers on one side, clients on the other side. We have additional equipment. One was meant for the Teradici hardware test, and uh, Sean will uh, talk about that test in a, in a, in a bit. Uh, we are using an Epiphan frame grabber uh, that allows us just to connect the client, the video output of a client to that device, and that device generates a video signal and sends it through a USB port to a recorder PC. By doing that, we did not need to install any recording software on the client because that would that would modify the results. Right. So uh, it would influence the results. Yeah, you can do this without hardware. You can just use something like Fraps, but Fraps does add a little bit of CPU impact on the client side machine when you're doing your recording. But if you're just doing kind of a low tech comparison, you're using Fraps in all places, it's not bad. But uh, a frame grabber like the Epiphan is a much better approach. Yeah. And we're able to capture about uh, 60 frames per second natively off the wire uh, over a DVI uh, signal at, at 1024 by 768. So we can really get a very high quality video signal 
uh, right off of this device. And we didn't only want to see how good the performance is on the LAN, because the LAN is sort of boring. Uh, interesting things are happening on the wide area network. So we needed a WAN emulator. And we are happy to say that Apposite, they provided us uh, uh, hardware appliances uh, for WAN emulation. And uh, so we were able to use the Apposite boxes to do the WAN emulation. Yeah, and in previous generations of our uh, remoting protocol videos, we used uh, a combination of some software supplied by Shunra, which was very nice of Shunra to supply us the software. Uh, and also WANM, which is a, a TCS uh, open, uh, a free WAN emulator. So we've used both of those in the past, but now we've moved to the, uh, the Apposite uh, hardware appliance, so it's uh, much more consistent. Then we were using many test applications to go through all the different graphics format, GDI, video, Flash, Silverlight, uh, OpenGL, DirectX. And uh, so what I will do is I will just give you an idea how we do it, so going back to my Windows 7 box. So you see up here is a, uh, a command a prompt. And one thing I want to mention about these test cases. So we went out and randomly collected some uh, test samples for GDI and Flash and Silverlight and all these kinds of things. We've tried to have everything be completely localized wherever possible so that everything is self-contained on the machine. Uh, and we've used AutoIt to perform scripting of the host side uh, rendering tests. That way, as much as possible, we try to keep the video synced where we can. So you will see some variances in the start time of different so uh, solutions, but we automate the, uh, the actual demo itself. Hands off. So this is what happens automatically. That happens for the next 60 seconds. And we record those video clips. And we have always 45 second clips that we uh, yeah, can stitch together then to compare yeah. the results. Uh, altogether, we recorded a, a roughly 400, 400 videos. Yeah. And this is about the fourth time we've done this. So in total, we've recorded well over 1,000 videos Yeah, sometimes for all I these dream, protocols. I dream about these <laughs> things here. So I see sea scooters in my dream. So it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, OK, let's stop that. And uh, let's do the same thing on the remote effects side, this time on, uh, on a terminal server, on a remote desktop session host. So let's do just exactly the same thing. And now the challenge is, can you tell me if this remote effects enabled output is better than the one that we, that we were seeing before? Yeah, it looks like it's better, but are we sure? So that was the challenge that we also had. How, how, can, we, how can we deal with that challenge that we cannot really compare things so easily because it's graphics output? And uh, because of that, we made sure that we come up with a good methodology to let you compare those things. This is just the matrix of the videos that we recorded. So you see all the different protocols. You see all the different scenarios. And uh, you see we did that for the LAN, for 2 megabit with 50 milliseconds, and for 2 megabit with 200 milliseconds uh, latency. And those are, those are round-trip latency numbers. Yeah. So the 200 milliseconds is 100 each way. And for packet loss, we're using 0.01% packet loss. Now, this is not intended to emulate real-world internet connections. We're not after doing that, because to do it over real-world internet, there's no way we can fairly compare the protocols, because the conditions of the internet are going to be variable for every single test. So what we aimed to uh, emulate for the WAN, uh, uh, WAN emulation was a corporate MPLS circuit, which typically has like about a 0.01% packet loss if you've got a good provider. So that's what we aim for. And you see here the PC over IP and hardware has a slightly different background color. Can you elaborate yeah, on that? Yeah, so um, in previous tests that we had conducted, we used the Teradici PC over IP host card as well as the PC over IP portal. And when we went through this rev of the testing, we had upgraded the firmware because the firmware we were using previously was several generations old. And uh, after upgrading the firmware, we were not able to get uh, good results. And I don't know if this is a fault of the firmware upgrade, a fault of the hardware, but regardless of the circumstance, uh, we spoke with Teradici and we agreed that we would not show the results because they were not favorable uh, for Teradici. And we know from past experience that the results are actually very good. So we did not include the hardware PC over IP, but we do have the VMware View software PC over IP comparison yeah. that we'll show you. So as I said, in order to compare them, we decided that we want to create four up split screen video comparison. Um, and we do that through Silverlight. So uh, what we did, we took the videos that we recorded in the native resolution. I sent them through Media Encoder 
to encode them in a slightly, in, in only the quarter of the size format. And then I was using um, expression, expression blend to create Silverlight applications, and I dropped four of those videos into each of those Silverlight applications. So we can run them, the videos, side by side in the, in the Silverlight applications. And through the uh, re-encoding of the video with a constant bit rate, we make sure that all the videos, well. Retain as much quality as possible. Absolutely. First, retain as much quality as possible and have the same bit rate. So I don't want to compare a video with a file size of 20 megabyte with a video that has only 2 megabyte. So that is not fair, because my hard disk may not be fast enough. Even though we are running everything from an SSD to make sure that the video load time is good enough. So we do this comparison for RDP and remote effects. We do it for RDC, remote desktop connection, WAN settings. And I'm going to show you what I, what I mean when there are things like a latency hint. There's something you may learn here that you didn't know before, even though you have the RDP client on your machine and maybe working with it every single day. Now, if you go to the Options and the Experience tab, and you drop it down, now let's zoom into it, you see that there are settings that say high latency. This high latency setting during the negotiation process gives the host a hint that things are happening through a wide area network. Who of you didn't know that, that this hinting is really important? Oh, one, thank you. Working for Microsoft? No. <laughs> Ruben. And, and by the way, the thing that's troubling about these settings is most people connecting in from home would look at this setting and say, well, my work is only you know, 30 miles away, so I'm going to choose the high-speed broadband 2, two, to, 2 to 10 megabits per second, which doesn't say anything about latency. And uh, even if you have, let's say, a 50 millisecond uh, latency, you can get much better performance with the high latency settings on certain types of media than you can on the, on the normal high-speed broadband. So I think we actually have one of the videos to show that. So I just, yeah, just give you an idea of what these videos look like. So these are these four up comparison videos. So we'll, you will see many of those, and we will always explain what's going on here on the left, in the left upper uh, quadrant. There's a physical PC compared to RDP on Hyper-V. Uh, compared to the left lower side with uh, remote effects on a uh, remote desktop session host, in the right lower, on the right lower side, it's remote effects in Hyper-V. And you see, for GDI, there's not much of a difference. It looks pretty much like a, a physical PC. Yeah, there's but some will, bitmap will, in there, but even still, it's, it's still very comparable. And we did the same thing for the hardware-accelerated protocols and the software-based protocols. So Citrix, HDX3D Pro, HP RGS, RDP 7.1 with remote effects on Hyper-V and a physical PC without remoting to have a baseline. How good does it look when you're using the physical PC? And the software-based Citrix, VM Review, Quest AOP, Eric Complace. So these are the settings. OK, let's dive into it. First of all, GDI primitives. And uh, the good news here is that the GDI primitive remoting works really, really well for all the different protocols. It's, it's, it's amazing how good it works. So what we did is we did a test that stretches it to the limits because all the other tests with the low uh, latency or no latency was really good. We were selecting the 200 millisecond latency to compare RDP to remote effects. Bear in mind, remote effects was never designed to run on a wide area network. But still, if you just look at the physical PC here, and you have the standard RDP running in the upper right quadrant, and down here you have remote effects, and you really can see the difference between the two, in particular when it was loading at the beginning. Right. So remote effects makes a difference here, and uh, we'll see how that will improve in the future. That's not something that we will be able to show you here, but we know that Microsoft may be working on improving that. So now we take a look at it from uh, a software perspective uh, with the protocols from Citrix, VMware, um, Quest. Quest, and Ericom. And Ericom. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you see. 
when it comes to pure GDI, there's GDI, really very little difference even in, in high latency scenarios. Yeah, it's really good. No doubt about it. They all did their jobs very, very well. So if you have that, uh, that knowledge worker scenario that everyone always talks about, um, you know, it really doesn't matter what protocol you use, even in WAN conditions, they're all pretty much uh, equally well suited. Now we wanted to look into PDF, because PDF is not only GDI remoting, because PDF pro uh, creates bitmaps. And they're harder to deal with. Again, 2 megabit at 200 milliseconds. Same protocols in software. And yet all and doing again, a pretty good job. All of them doing a really, really good job. So that means if you see those demos only showing PDF or GDI, hmm, they're all doing good. <laughs> so this is why we didn't want to dig deeper into that, because, oh, not even, we don't show the hardware accelerator, because even if the, if the software can do such a good job, why should we look at the hardware? We look at the hardware rather at the 3D stuff. So now the data, the amount of data is getting bigger. We're going to look at video and animation. So video encoding and decoding is very expensive on the, uh, on the resource side, both when you look at the CPU, GPU, and the bandwidth that is required. So uh, let's look into some of these examples. And you see the, the window, uh, the WMV redirection, uh, helps a lot if you redirect the video stream to the client. That means that you do not need to decode the video on the host to render it on the host, and then to, cr to create yet another video that you sent down the wire. Because that's nothing. Uh, that, that's all you are doing. If you if you render uh, the videos on the host side, you decode and encode on the same side at the same moment. And, and this, this becomes is not very effective. this becomes particularly important uh, in the context of VDI when you have to have hundreds of virtual desktops on the same host hardware, because it's very expensive to do the decode of the WMV content and then re-encode it to send it back down. So definitely something you have to be concerned about for scalability. So we do the software uh, protocols now. It's the uh, Citrix, VMware, uh, or Teradici, the uh, Quest, and the um, Ericom again at 200 milliseconds. But now it's a video. This is a standard definition. Uh, it's an Xbox Halo video. It's standard definition video, so it's not a very high bit rate, so two megabit per second is more than adequate for streaming that content. And just let me start it again, because what you can see here is one of the protocols is buffering longer than the others. It's uh, in the lower left quadrant. It's EOP. It's, it's uh, Quest EOP, so it's buffering longer. Uh, but it gives it later the advantage that the video runs smoother. And so uh, both, both the HDX uh, in the upper left and the EOP in the lower left are both doing uh, client-side redirection. The, uh, the two on the right, uh, VMware View, is not currently supporting MMR or multimedia redirection on Windows 7. They do support it on Windows XP. So you'll notice that the video is much more choppy over there and it's much more compressed, whereas the two on the left, particularly the Citrix HDX one, very, very smooth video. Again, this is all client-side rendering, so it's just streaming the video down using the local media player to play it back. Now, there's one caveat to talk about with uh, client-side redirection. First of all, the client side has to have enough horsepower to play back your multimedia content. So if you're looking at using thin clients or these types of devices, you need to make sure that the CPU and the device is capable of doing the video decode, particularly when you're dealing with HD content. The second area you have to be concerned about is what types of multimedia are you playing back within the Windows Media Player? because it uses direct show uh, for MMR redirection. So if your player is not using direct show, let's say it's QuickTime, it's based on Quartz, you don't get client-side redirection. Also, when it comes to the codecs that your video is encoded with, if you have off-the-wall codecs that you're using, those have to be present on the client-side device in order to do the decode. So if you're using DivX or XVID or some of these other third-party codecs, you may have to have those deployed on the client-side machines in order for that multimedia redirection to occur. Otherwise, you're going to get host-side rendering. Remember the negotiation? If the client says, no, I have no idea about this format, it's going to be rendered on the host side. Now let's do the same thing with a high-definition video. And for this video, we uh, provided 6 megabit bandwidth instead of 2 megabit. And that's just required because it's a higher bit rate video. You need at least 4 to 5 megabit for a 720p video. Same protocols to compare. So in this one, um, 
HDX Zen does a, a pretty smooth job with the video. Uh, VMware View is, is doing a great job in terms of the, the speed of the video, but you can see it's a bit more choppy and a bit more compressed. Uh, EOP does an excellent job, much like HDX does. And in this case, Blaze is actually choking quite a bit. It's doing all host side rendering, and apparently it's not dropping frames in between, so it's doing a very poor job in this case. Now let's take a look at the same thing if we do it in hardware. So now we're looking at the hardware accelerated protocols. And uh, we have to point out, in all fairness, the upper two videos are one-on-one -on -one connections. So it's one dedicated workstation that is talking to a client device, while RemoteFX in the lower left quadrant is a shared environment, and as I pointed out before, RemoteFX was never built to support WAN scenarios, but still, it's doing pretty well. Yeah, in this case, RemoteFX is not performing host-side rendering or getting client-side MMR redirection, so it is just streaming the video down to the client-side machine, uh, unlike most of RemoteFX that performs host-side rendering. So RemoteFX, even in this WAN condition, is doing a pretty good job uh, matching the rest of them, uh, even given the fact that it's 50 milliseconds. And now we're doing a QuickTime video, because we can be pretty sure that QuickTime cannot be redirected. Now, one of the things that's interesting about QuickTime, when you start having conversations with vendors about uh, your VDI initiatives, um, particularly organizations like education have to be concerned, because a lot of times their learning systems are designed around QuickTime. And if you have a system designed around QuickTime and you're getting all host-side rendering, you have to scale appropriately within VDI, and you may have to be very concerned about how this works over the WAN, because it's a very uh, heavyweight protocol. Media format, I guess I should say. So here we've got um, Claudia with a chance of meatballs video that we've run through on all four of them. And none of these are going to perform client-side rendering. This is all going to be host-side rendering. But the different protocols do uh, a, a slightly different job at how they optimize the server rendered video. So this can be done a m number of different ways. A vendor can drop frames. They can do sort of differential compression depending on what objects are moving on the screen. Um, and so it, it kind of depends on the vendors. You notice that HDX and VMware View both do a very, very good job. Uh, Quest uh, does a, a slightly uh, poorer experience than the other two. Uh, and Blaze does a very, very uh, poor job of the server side rendering of this one. But all of them are keeping up generally pretty well. So some of the things that we, we sometimes like to look at with these different protocols is how do they actually look on the wire? So with the use of the apposite device, you can actually look for any given test scenario and see how much bandwidth was consumed by each protocol. So in this, uh, in this four up we have here, up at the top we have Citrix HDX. And you can see, even though we've given it a six megabit WAN connection, it's only consuming at peak between two and three megabits per second. So again, it does a very good job of the host side video rendering. Uh, some of the other protocols, we've got VMware View below that, which is uh, spiking up pretty close to six megabit for a lot of the time. Uh, Quest EOP is pretty much at the peak of six megabit the entire time. And Ericom Blaze, you see a very, very high uh, peak initially, and then it drops off. If you saw in the video, um, near the end, the Ericom Blaze got extremely choppy and wasn't playing back smoothly at all. And uh, I think it just kind of got to the point where it couldn't keep up with the video stream and then started dropping off on the performance. So the bandwidth did drop down on there, but it really wasn't performing well. The other thing we started looking at is what is the host side CPU impact? So if you look on the, t on the two on the left, Citrix HDX as well as uh, Quest EOP, because they're doing client-side remoting or, or MMR of that video content, you see very, very little host CPU impact. Now, if we looked at the client-side impact, you'd see that CPU spike on the client-side device. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see with uh, VMware View as well as Ericom Blaze, they're performing all host-side rendering, so you're going to see a much higher amount of CPU. Now, uh, in these circumstances, these are all VMs. They've been assigned two virtual CPUs and four gigabytes of RAM, so they're pretty beefy VMs. Uh, but even still, we see on the host side, we have about 15% CPU on the VMware View solution. And on Blaze, it's, it's just enormous. So of course, when you're scaling a VDI architecture, you want to minimize the host side CPU as much as you can and do intelligent client side rendering where it makes sense, unless you've got the capability to do some very optimized host side compression, which would minimize the CPU impact if you're able to leverage the graphics uh, encoding. So now let's take a look at Flash and Silverlight. And uh, now we have the same sort of 
video uh, comparisons. Let's start with RDP and remote effects first on the LAN. We do a silver light demo on the LAN using the uh, physical box, RDP, and remote effects again. So it's the same setup. And uh, you will see it's a, it's a very graphics rich uh, application, but they're all doing really, really well. So on the LAN, it's not very hard because you've got a hundred megabit of bandwidth. It's yep. you're you're never going to really uh, look at that. This here into is a, the, the poor, physical poor PC, and the others are remoted. So uh, that's really really good. But it's remoted over the LAN, so yes, it's not. Yes, absolutely. A, now let's do the same with fi uh, two megabit and fifty milliseconds uh, latency. Do the same comparison, and now we will see the differences. You will see RDP in the upper right quadrant is really struggling with that scenario, while remote FX is doing really, really well, no matter if it's from the terminal server or if it's from a VDI environment. So you see what RDP is doing. And this is something that many users complain about if they are RDPing into uh, their work environment from a remote loca location. So if it's a 50 millisecond latency connection, yeah, this is not usable. And this is a great example of the lossless versus lossy. When yep. you end up having the entire image you have to paint down in full fidelity to the client, you get these, uh, these tiles that get painted. Uh, and because there's not a lot of caching that can be done because the image is constantly changing, it has to retransmit the entire image down every time. So it's very expensive uh, in terms of uh, user experience. Now we do it with a software-supported, software-based product calls using 200 milliseconds latency. Yes. So now this is much more of an extreme WAN condition. But uh, even given that we've got uh, 200 milliseconds of latency, uh, VMware View and HDX do a very admirable job at this latency of keeping up with the, uh, the changing pictures. Uh, EOP and Blaze struggle a little bit more. You can see some more frame skipping there. It's not quite as smooth. But uh, again, in my mind, still pretty acceptable given the fact that it's almost a full screen repaint uh, with the, uh, the crossfading and, and Ken Burns zooming. So I, I think that's still pretty good at 200 milliseconds. Yep. And out we do it, hardware accelerated. Again, the upper two are 101 connectivities, 101 connections. And uh, lower the left. remote effects, the lower left, the remote effects is a shared environment. So it's not a, not a very fair comparison, but still we wanted to show this comparison. Yeah. And remote effects, again, as Benny said earlier, was never designed to be used at 200 milliseconds. We're really, really pushing the envelope. Um, but keep in mind, we're, we're doing sort of, we're pushing content from one side to the other. Um, interacting with a 200 millisecond remote effects session is not a very pleasant experience. So the entire feedback loop is not good at that kind of latency. But just to demonstrate one-sided delivery of content, remote effects does an excellent job even at 200 milliseconds, which it was never designed to do. Yep. So that's a silver light part of it. The interesting thing about it, if we do the silver light on the remote effects side based on Hyper-V, I took a look at the LAN. And I look at the spikes on the network. So uh, um, in, at that moment, remote FX takes as much bandwidth as it can get. So I allowed it to take up to 100 megabit per second. And it, in fact, took up to 50, 55 megabit per second. So uh, I mean, that makes an end to that myth that some of the protocols can live with just 128K or something like that. If you constrain them to 128K, the performance and the user experience will be accordingly. If you really want to have a good user experience, like I had that uh, on the LAN, you will need a lot of bandwidth. And the question yeah. is, is your corporate environment capable of providing that sort of bandwidth if you're distributing videos in your corporate LAN? In your home network, that might be a lot easier because you're alone in your home network. In your home network. Right. Yeah, Benny and I uh, have been around the terminal services and the RDS market for a no long number of years. And uh, a long running myth was that uh, RDP operated on 56 kilobits of bandwidth and, and ICA worked at 28 kilobits of bandwidth. And this is absolutely false. Please don't uh, uh, believe when people say that. It's absolutely not true. Uh, if you're doing pure GDI, like we showed that WordPad document earlier, a lot of the protocols can operate well under you know, 256 kilobits or 128 kilobits. But when it comes to anything more graphically rich, you're going to be pushing 3 to 10 megabits per second, depending on what, what kind of media you're dealing with. So it's absolutely not true that these things are that optimized. It's, it's not possible. Now we're going to do the same thing for Flash. 
And uh, traditionally, Flash is rendered on the host side because Flash redirection is not simple. But more and more of, of, the, of the, um, <laughs> the companies that are extending the remoting protocol um, market, uh, they can do Flash redirection. Uh, Citrix can do that uh, if the latency is less than 30 milliseconds. It's actually tunable. You can go up to 50 it's, milliseconds. It's, yeah. but it's, uh, it's a very chatty redirection, so it doesn't work very well at 50 milliseconds. Uh, Quest EOP is one that does do client-side flash redirection at uh, much higher latencies, up to about 200 or 300 milliseconds quite well. If you take a look at RDP and remote effects on the LAN, we see the same thing as we have, uh, as we have seen before. Even RDP can do that fairly well. So not much of a difference. You see, the upper left quadrant is a physical PC, and it doesn't look much different to the physical PC, actually. And again, keep in mind, these are all over a LAN. So if they're taking 50, 60 megabits per second, it really doesn't matter. The user experience is pretty good. Now we do it on 2 megabit, 50 milliseconds. And as you've seen it before, you will see again that RDP is struggling with that, while remote effects is doing a much better job here. Remote effects, upper right quadrant. No, upper right RDP. Yeah. Remote effects at the bottom. Uh, yeah, remote yeah. Uh, RDP, yeah. Remote effects are the two on the bottom. But you can see it's much smoother on remote effects because we're getting that host side rendering. We're not trying to send down every single frame that, that passes the screen. So RDP is much choppier, whereas remote effects provides a much smoother experience. And here's the thing that I, that I set with, RD, uh, with the RDC client. Now, oh, this is very good what to see. What we did here is we used this hinting. So on the, in, on the left upper quadrant, it's uh, 2 megabit at 50 milliseconds. And down here, it's 2 megabit at 200 milliseconds with high speed, without the hinting. And on the right side, we have the hinting. So the star here, that it says it's, it includes the hint. Now you see that we did not have the hinting here on the uh, upper left quadrant. So if you compare the two in the upper uh, side of the, of, of the videos, they are pretty much the same because the hinting does compensate more than 150 milliseconds latency. While without the hinting, I'm going to restart that if I fight the button. You so I think this, it's is, this is. It's almost unusable. So it really makes a difference what you select on your RDP client. If you have this high latency hint, for the handshake, for the negotiation, or if you have it not. And I think it's unfortunate because Microsoft doesn't really describe in the RDC connection parameters what they mean by high latency. Like, I don't view 50 milliseconds as being high latency, but you can clearly tell that at 50 milliseconds uh, without the hint uh, and 200 milliseconds with the hint, they're actually quite comparable in performance. So they have great technology, but they're hiding it. So it's, it's, it's hard to understand for us. <laughs> Good. Now we're going to do the same thing with 200 milliseconds uh, latency with the software-enabled protocols. Flash HD video. So this, this flash video is about 500 kilobits per second. And uh, what you're going to notice is that the VMware View, HDX Zen, and the Blaze somewhat start pretty immediately. The HDX and the VMware View are both fairly smooth. The Blaze stutters a little bit. In the lower left corner of the EOP, you notice it's extremely smooth. And the reason for this being so smooth is it's performing client-side flash redirection. So the flash content streams down to the client device and plays back locally. So you get a very physical PC-like experience, even though you're remoting it over 200 milliseconds, because the client-side device is rendering the flash content. It's not being sent from the server as a, as a rendered video. Now, <laughs> for this one, I want to give some disclosure here. We, we got special permission from Citrix to show their next generation flash redirection. So a couple slides back, we talked about HDX was only capable at remoting flash up to 30 milliseconds. Citrix is working on a new release of HDX that will support flash redirection up to two to 300 milliseconds. So we were able to show that here today, even though it's unreleased. And it is early pre-production code, so uh, just keep that in mind. It, it may even get better. And it's only a two-up. Yes, we only did a two-up. We're showing the old HDX versus the new HDX. 
So on the left-hand side, we've got the traditional HDX that performs host-side rendering. And on the right, we've got uh, client rendered. Uh, they're both at two megabit, 200 milliseconds. But uh, you notice that the one on the right takes quite a bit longer to get started. And that's because it's stream streaming the content down to the client device. And now you see the, the right side video is very, very smooth as if it's on a local PC. It's hard to tell with these videos because they're kind of small and you're, you're kind of far back. But um, the right side video is very, very clear and crisp if you're able to look at it on a full screen. The left hand one is doing a lot of compression. So you see a lot of artifacts in the flash content. So the client side rendering in this case, even over a, a fairly high latency WAN connection, is a very, very good user experience. Here's a screenshot of our Apricid monitoring uh, uh, website, uh, web, web page. And it shows you the consumption of the two flash scenarios that we were using and the silver light scenario on RDP on the LAN. Yeah, so this first one here is the Intel Flash video that we showed you, the Intel Flash animation. The second one in the middle there is the HD video that we showed you, the Flash HD video. And then on the right is the Silverlight uh, photo gallery. And you can see the quite a bit of bandwidth. The pattern is about the same if you look at the first and the third uh, of these scenarios. So Flash and Silverlight, when it comes to remoting, behave pretty similar. But look at the spikes. They go up to 80 megabit per second. So that's the bandwidth requirement that they had. In average, we had like 60 megabit per second. So this is impressive. As I said before, you'd rather do that on your home network and not in your corporate network. Um, so that was, that was very interesting for us to find out. Now, moving to 3D graphics, where things are getting more interesting. I don't want to dive into how the architectures look like for uh, Direct3D and OpenGL. Just to mention that it's two stacks if you compare it to GDI. So you can mix and match GDI and DirectX content in one window. But still, it's two different graphics pipelines or two different graphics stacks that you're using. And the same is true for OpenGL. So we have GDI on the right side and the OpenGL stack on the left side. Where OpenGL is using uh, some of the, uh, is, is based on the uh, DirectX API. So again, most of the DirectX or OpenGL remoting was traditionally done on the host side when you look at RDP, for example. And we have that compatibility list. Uh, All right. So since Benny, started, Benny and I started this about two or three years ago, we were originally working on Windows XP, and we've since now refactored all of this for Windows 7. But there's some key things you have to be aware of when it comes to some of these graphics formats. If you're using Windows XP desktop still, you're not going to have capability for uh, hardware D3D 10 and 11 because it's not supported on that platform. The other thing to be aware of is support for hardware OpenGL under Win 7 RDP and under Win XP RDP is, is not there. Microsoft doesn't have full support for hardware accelerated OpenGL. They do have it for D3D, but uh, not for the, uh, the OpenGL stuff. So let's see some of these uh, videos again. This one's all software OpenGL, so it can be run on any platform. RDP, yeah. The thing is, the video, I did not record the video. It did not. It's not that it didn't work because you see it, you saw it before. I did exactly that video on, on RDP, on, on Hyper-V, but I only recorded the remote effects videos. So you see the physical PC in the, uh, on the upper left quadrant and, and uh, remote effects in the lower part of the... Uh, and again, video. to be clear, the physical PC, of course, there's no network involved. This is just locally right off the video. The two at the bottom are two megabit, 50 milliseconds. So you should expect a degraded quality yep. versus a local PC. So nothing that is unexpected. Now we do hardware, the same demo with 200 milliseconds latency. And again, because this is software OpenGL, you're not going to get any of the major benefits of the graphic accelerator. But in this circumstance, they're all pretty much similar in terms of their capabilities. Now, remote effects at 200 milliseconds, again, quite a bit choppier than the other protocols, but again, it was never designed for that use case. So if you look at the two at the top, HDX 3D Pro and HP RGS, these are both doing a very good job. Uh, RGS stutters a little bit more versus uh, HDX 3D, but HDX 3D has higher uh, compression. So it's smoother, but more lossy. Now we're doing a real high-end OpenGL demo. 
and uh, it will not be running on remote effects. Uh, yeah, the reason for that is RemoteFX is currently only supplying the OpenGL 1.1 specification in hardware. Everything newer than 1.1 is not supported by RemoteFX. So if you have newer hardware OpenGL applications you need to deal with, you're going to need to look at uh, RGS or HDX3D or, or someone else that can, uh, can do that. But again, in the case of RemoteFX, this is a VM versus the other solutions that are physical PCs. So if you're talking about scaling a large number of people, um, you're, you're not going to be able to easily do that in a VM side today. Now doing uh, DirectX 9, a roller coaster demo. And the interesting thing about this demo is look at the, the frame rate that uh, it believes it's sending. <laughs> it believes it's sending. <laughs> Yeah, so the frame rates on these you're probably seeing in the neighborhood of, you know, 200 to, to 800 frames per second. Of course, none of these remoting protocols can deliver that. Even, even on a LAN, they can't deliver that much uh, frame rate uh, very effectively. But uh, what you're seeing is even at 200 milliseconds and 2 megabit, uh, RGS and HDX3D are actually pretty respectable uh, in terms of keeping up with the fluidity of the user experience. Now, they do stutter quite a bit, and you can tell there's a, a heavyweight amount of compression and lossiness here versus the physical PC. But uh, it gives you a rough idea of, uh, of how these things work over the WAN. And RemoteFX is struggling, but again, 200 milliseconds, way outside of the scope of what RemoteFX was designed for. And a shared environment yes. for multiple users. But the point is, is it actually does run, so you get your D3D acceleration yeah. uh, of your applications on the VM platform. Can we show that? Google Earth? Are you sure? Yeah, why not? Oh. <laughs> it's tech -ed. OK. <laughs> well, we're also showing view. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, this is Google Earth, which can run in either OpenGL mode or DirectX D3, uh, D3D9. So we're using the D3D version. And of course, on a physical PC, the experience is excellent. Uh, over the 2 megabit, 200 milliseconds, RGS and HDX3D keep up uh, pretty well. Uh, HDX a bit smoother than, than RGS is. Uh, and RemoteFX is, is really struggling in this, in this scenario. But again, was not designed for this kind of network condition. So I want to be very clear that uh, it's not expected that it would perform well in this circumstance. But it gets you there. You can run those applications on remote effects, which is not possible with standard, uh, standard RDP. Right. That, that is the major difference between the two. And again, most people wouldn't be building this for 200 milliseconds. No. Um, but it does make the most interesting uh, uh, scenarios. <laughs> and now we go into DX10. Yep. So this application is a. Um, uh, a DirectX 10, a D3D 10 application, which RemoteFX is not supporting at this time. RemoteFX only supports D3D 9. So if you have a need for a DirectX 10 or DirectX 11 applications, you're going to want to use uh, another product. But uh, you have HDX 3D on the upper left quadrant doing a very good job uh, with a, a very fluid user experience. RGS is also keeping up very well. Um, pretty close to the physical PC experience. Which really amazes me when I look at these videos. Uh, I did not expect that. I did not expect the hardware accelerated protocols to be so good. So as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to OpenGL, I have a screenshot here from an OpenGL uh, test utility that shows you on the left-hand side your HDX 3D Pro or HP RGS, where you have direct access to the GPU. In this case, it's an NVIDIA Quadro FX 3800. And you can see that going down the specifications for OpenGL from 1.1 all the way down to 4.0, we have almost 100% compliance because, again, we have the native NVIDIA driver in this circumstance. And all of those things are supported for hardware OpenGL. When we go to the right-hand side and look at the OpenGL that's exposed through RemoteFX, again, this is a virtualized GPU. I'm not getting direct access to the ATI or NVIDIA GPU. I'm getting a shared slice of it. So uh, currently, this is supporting the full feature set of OpenGL 1.1 and a small portion of 1.2, but nothing beyond that is supported. So those are all unsupported extensions. So like we showed in that video before with the flag and, and some of these other things, when it's a hardware OpenGL beyond 1.1, this does not currently run over remote effects. So one of the things that we also wanna, wanted to look into is uh, the, the Windows 7 desktop rendering, more like the uh, Windows uh, Presentation Foundation things. And even if we presented the Silverlight uh, demos that are pretty, pretty similar to, to what the WPF does, we uh, wanted to show it separately. So uh, the rendering happens 
When you look at the old RDP uh, methodology, it happens on the host side. And uh, yeah, WPF, in, with all the protocols, ends up being host side rendered. Yes. There's no WPF primitives today. Today, there's no redirection. Yeah, possible. no redirection. Yeah. So uh, let's take a look at it with the uh, software rendering at 50 milliseconds. So this application is called Medios. It's an open source uh, media center application that I contribute some code to. Uh, it is all WPF based. We're using a lot of um, uh, rich uh, transitions and fade effects. So it leverages the host side uh, GPU uh, uh, quite a bit uh, if it's available. In this case, uh, we're running on the software based protocol. So we're going to do a lot of uh, CPU host uh, rendering. And what you can see is because this is very bitmap oriented with the, the fade and the transitions, uh, some of the protocols uh, will do a much better job with this than others because of the amount of lossy compression that they're performing. So HDX and uh, VMware View both doing a pretty good job at uh, 50 milliseconds and, and uh, 2 megabit. Uh, EOP and Blaze also not doing a very bad job either. Now stretching it a little bit and going to 200 milliseconds. So if you're looking at that, you're not surprised if you get the uh, support calls from your users when they're remoting into your system from far away. Yeah, now this is actually a, a very graphically rich application that you probably wouldn't be run, running over a remoting protocol. But just to give you an idea, you know, even at 200 milliseconds, these are all doing a pretty good job given the uh, richness of the graphics. But it shows you the limits of these protocols uh, when you're doing that in software. <laughs> and now we have some very special thing. Ah, that's your favorite. Yeah, so when Benny and I first started doing this, we were doing all these host side and client side rendered videos where we're just cramming a bunch of data down to the client. But the thing it doesn't give you a good appreciation for is what the full feedback loop is from a client perspective. So if I'm receiving this big video stream and I try interacting with it by resizing the window or doing something like that, and some of these protocols, because they're shoving down a bulk traffic, uh, you may not be able to interact with the application very easily. So you click a button to resize the window and it doesn't respond for 15 seconds because it's just cramming data down as fast as it can. So I had the idea of how could I create a situation where some video content would come down to me or some graphical content would come down. I would have to move my mouse and react and then click and change the feedback loop and then the server would have to respond and send me some more data. So I thought the best way to do this would be to actually like play a game. So uh, this didn't go over well in Europe because apparently whack-a-mole is not well known in Europe. <laughs> but uh, but in the states, I some explanation. but in the states, everyone's gone to the arcade before, and you got the little thing where you get the mallet and you have to whack the moles as they come up. So I found a flash-based version of this, and I actually played whack-a-mole, which was cool the first three or four times. And after about <laughs> twenty or thirty times of playing whack-a-mole, I got quite tired of it. But um, I think you'll see some interesting things with this. So this is two hundred milliseconds at uh, two megabit, and we're comparing the software-based protocols. So in the upper left corner, we've got uh, HDX, Citrix HDX. Upper right corner, we have VMware View. Lower left, Quest EOP. Lower right, Aracom Blaze. Now notice how smooth the animation of the guy hitting the moles uh, is on, on Quest, because we're doing client-side flash redirection. All the other ones are doing host-side uh, rendering. And, and don't take too much consideration to the scores, because it is a human uh, test. And, I'm subject to being really good certain times and not so good other times. But I think it gives you a good idea. You can see how slow, in the case of Eric on Blaze, how slow the performance of the, of the video transitions are and how hard it is sometimes to track the moles on the screen, whereas some of the other protocols do a much better job, particularly the EOP protocol. <laughs> I never got so good at this game as, as Oh, I've, I've become a master. <laughs> I've done this so many times. <laughs> now, doing the same. Hardware accelerated. Now, in these cases, you're not going to get the uh, client side rendering. Everything's going to be host side rendered. So, we have a physical PC that uh, I immediately start working. You see, uh, in the case of RGS and HDX across the top there, um, on the case of RGS, you'll see quite a bit of delay between when I click, I don't know if you can see the mouse pointer, but I'm clicking it, and it's quite a bit of delay before the actual mallet goes up there. Whereas the case, uh, and same thing with remote effects in the lower left corner, upper left uh, HDX 
3D, you're seeing very, very quick responsiveness to the user positioning the mouse and clicking. So I think this is a key way of looking at user experience of how interactive is the user able to be with the application before the server recognizes the mouse positioning and click and then sends the resultant video content back to the client. This is very, very important for having to interact with, let's say, 3D applications. You have to turn an object, and you're going to get a few megabits of data sent down to the client. Yeah, what, what, what I really noticed here that, that remote effects is sort of struggling with that. Uh, right, but again, this is 200 milliseconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was not designed for this at all. It was not for, for that, but this is exactly where you where you come to the limits with uh, with remote effects as a technology, and this is why we are both waiting for the remote effects um, hardware chip decoder for the client side because we expect their more responsiveness from from uh, this hardware. If you go down to the exhibition area, you find the remote effects pavilion and you find the, the prototype of these uh, upcoming clients there. There are several vendors that have those clients there. And there are also the, uh, uh, the uh, vendors like, like Quest and like Citrix that will embrace remote effects as a product call. So adding the, the functionality that remote effects performs well on the wide area network. So this will be a third party extension, I guess, um, in, in the future rather than Microsoft is doing it completely alone. So there will still be this ecosystem as we have it today. So remote effects, as I see it today, will not necessarily eliminate the need for all the other protocols because you are seeing very clearly the differences between the protocols, in particular when we are talking about WAN scenarios. Now, as a very final scenario, we have that whack-a-mole again with the yes. uh, preview. So this is from the Citrix. this is the next generation HDX technology from Citrix that will allow for client-side flash rendering over uh, high latency WAN connections. So we again have the two-up video done with Camtasia, just to show uh, side by side of, of this same scenario with those two technologies. So on the left-hand side, we're getting host-side rendering. Still a pretty good user experience, but you do see quite a bit of delay between when I click the mole and when the guy reacts and hits it. On the right-hand side, this is almost identical to the physical PC scenario you no saw before. I have no you're doing that. You're so fast with it. I mean, I, I couldn't I, do that on a, on a physical box. I tell you, I'm a, I'm a master. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone needs anyone to come play whack-a-mole with their organization, I'm available for hire. Uh. <laughs> So yeah, definitely a very, very good user experience for Flash-based content. And uh, I'm sure you guys are seeing this, more and more Flash content and applications are coming up uh, in your organization. So if you're concerned about use cases around the WAN, uh, Quest EOP and the next generation HDX are really the only two protocols in my mind that do an excellent job for Flash because they do client-side remoting. Good. Right. Let's summarize what we've been seeing. Uh, it became very clear that these remoting protocols, they are really um, necessary to improve uh, to a certain extent if we want to have the uh, same user experience over the WAN as we have it on the LAN or on the physical box. But on the other side, you see how much has happened over the last couple of years. I mean, all these scenarios on the WAN would not have been possible two or three years ago. You would not have been able to play whack-a-mole right. and, and, and score any points with whack-a-mole three years ago. So uh, for a long time, uh, there was there was like it was like a rumor that nothing was going on in the remoting protocol market because everybody thought, okay, we have a status quo and there's not much that the vendors can do about it. But suddenly, obviously, something happened. And uh, so the, the quality of the user experience is, is uh, getting better and better every three to six months. So uh, I did the same presentation in Berlin, at TechEd in Berlin. That was in November. And we had to re-record all the videos because all the vendors came up with new versions with improved features, with improved user experience. So I guess we will have to do the same job in, in six months again, right. and adding new protocols, adding new, um, new scenarios. Because now, what we one, one thing that we didn't really talk about here, uh, and I, I want to address this just so everyone understands the, the use case scenarios. Um, you know, Citrix HDX has done a lot of work on doing really, really intelligent client-side remoting of various different technologies. 
And unfortunately, this takes a lot of development uh, effort and timeline to do. So there's sort of two schools of thought on remoting protocols. One school of thought is we're going to try to send down as much as we can to the client side device and render it on the client side. And then there's other protocols like Tiered Ichi, PC over IP, and remote FX that are saying we're not going to do client side remoting. We're going to do everything host side. And there's an advantage to that. The one advantage of doing all host side rendering is it is completely protocol uh, uh, and, and, and codec agnostic. You can run any kind of media content, 2D, 3D applications, it does not matter. And they can, they can treat all that content as the same because it's just basic video feed that gets sent down to the client. Um, but if you're going to do client-side rendering, it's, it's sort of a, a constant moving target that there's always some new uh, codec or some new video player, or whatever the case may be, that you don't work with and you have to develop a new extension to allow client-side remoting. Uh, as Benny mentioned before, in the case of Silverlight, and WPF and QuickTime, none of these are able to be done as client-side remoting today. So if you make a commitment to a vendor, you have to decide, are you always going to be chasing the target or are you going to try to go with the host-side rendered uh, solution that, that eliminates that? But again, the WAN makes a huge difference in Absolutely. those considerations. Absolutely. So what we found out is the bandwidth is so critical that two megabit are really essential, are required for getting a very good user experience. De depending on what they're doing. Exactly. Right. If, if they're, all they're doing is GDI applications, you can get by with 256 kilobits uh, or less. Yeah. But if they're doing any kind of multimedia content, That's 2 megabit the is the, the bare minimum. 60 megabit uh, spikes and 80 megabit spikes, as soon as you start doing that rich media redirection and rich media rendering, yeah, things are getting tough on the network. Uh, latency, things are getting tough if you get beyond 50 milliseconds, sometimes even at uh, more than 20 milliseconds. Right. So and this depends on the content. So if you're doing GDI, GDI works great upwards of 300 milliseconds. Uh, no problems at all. There's people that run GDI applications over satellite connections all the time. But when you start talking about this rich media, uh, everything beyond 50 milliseconds starts to degrade, as, as you saw in a lot of these videos. And the packet loss is also very, very important. So we did that with 0.01% uh, of packet loss, which we regarded as good. The question is, how does everything work with 1% packet loss? Or today, more. Today, the protocols cannot deal with that. There are um, and we didn't really talk about appliances. We, we need to do some testing with appliances that can fix that problem. It's hardware appliances on, on both ends of the network. And they can deal with, with uh, packet losses in, in a range of 1%. And they can deal with uh, more latency. So that's the next step that we also need to do for, for testing. Uh, and just to reiterate, we talked earlier, we were trying to emulate corporate MPLS networks here, which is why we chose 0.01% packet loss. You will never see packet loss that good on a typical internet connection. So um, Benny and I have talked about ways that we could actually do these tests uh, for real world internet connections, but it comes very hard to be impartial because you don't know what's going on with your internet connection when you, when you test one video versus the next. So it's, it's very difficult to compare them in a fair manner. And the best results are to see when you, uh, when you start using hardware on the host side, which is done with remote effects, which is done with HDX 3D, which is done with the Terra DG PC yeah. over IP in, in hardware. So RGS, it's the same thing. So uh, this is what we see as the future, it's hardware like the GPU for the masses. My question is, how long will we have to wait until we see uh, the support for feature-rich remoting on a home server? Because I want to have that in my home. Now I built one of those servers, and the next step is I want to buy, if I get it, one of those little boxes with the remote effects decoder chip. I want to start using it in my house, because the network is there. I have the hardware now, I have uh, both um, AMD, ATI uh, hardware, and I have the uh, NVIDIA hardware. So I really want I really want my family to use it and give me the feedback, how does it feel like using, using that stuff in, in, in my home environment. So I'm really looking forward to do that. To give you an impression how we did all the testing, I have a couple of, of, of uh, photos that I took during we did the test. That was the initial test uh, about a year ago, that was uh, in uh, Sean's home at the kitchen table because all the servers were in the basement, and I did not get get, uh, get permission to take pictures in his basement. Oh, it's ugly. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife's a very understanding person to allow me to have a rack of server stuff in the basement. So that was only the client equipment that we were using at that time, and it was stacked on his uh, on the table in his kitchen. 
So the next thing that we did, we presented that uh, session at uh, Synergy in Berlin, but we were not sure about some of the results. So uh, when Sean came over to Germany, so he, he, he came to, to Frankfurt, and he came to, to my house for a while, and we were testing in my lab, and we were not able to finalize all the tests. So we took all the equipment and we brought it to Berlin, and this is Sean's hotel room in Berlin just about 24 hours before we did the session at Citrix Synergy. So he's sitting there like, oh my god, is that correct? So this is the idea that you get when, uh, when we're doing those tests uh, right before uh, the uh, breakout sessions. This is in my lab uh, in Germany, and this is the new lab setup. And so what you see here is on the left side, this is the client that's down here. And here is the, the monitor. This is the server side. This is the shuttle PC that is running here with the high-end graphics card in there. Over there, that's the PC that records, that monitors all the network traffic. That's the apposite stuff. And here on the left side, that's the recorder PC that gets all the output from the client side. So you see here this little window that has exactly the same content as the uh, monitor here on this side. And I'm uh, recording this video at this very moment. And uh, this is the same view, uh, just from a different angle uh, on the uh, equipment. That's the, the shuttle with the NVIDIA. It's the FX uh, 3800 yep. that we're both using. And we are synchronizing all our data permanently, including all the drivers, to be sure that we're all using the same drivers uh, to do the testing. Because if uh, Sean sees something weird in his lab, he reports it back to me, and I try to recreate that. I, I was working on research for eight years, and it was, it was uh, for us, it was a law. It was a rule that if you cannot reproduce the result in a different lab with a different environment, it's not valid. And that's exactly what we're doing. If he gets a weird result, I'm trying to reproduce it, and vice versa. If I get a weird result, he's trying to reproduce it in his lab. And in many cases, we were struggling early on with both the ATI and the NVIDIA with yep. the drivers that the vendor supplied early on with remote effects because the drivers were quite buggy early on. So we had a, we had a lot of struggles with that. But so that's, here, that's all stable yep. now. So here you see the setup, the server on the left side, the client on the right side, and the apposite box on the top. So it's a very, very tiny box uh, that does the WAN emulation. And this is the hardware that you are using. Yeah, so um, I'm using a LAN box light, and the reason for that is I need to have additional PCI Express slots because I'm using the Teradici PC over IP hardware, using the Apposite Link Trippy Mini 2 box for WAN emulation. My client side device that I'm using for almost all the tests is this ViewSonic uh, Core 2 Duo T6600 uh, with like a 2 gig of RAM. And then this, uh, the stack in the center here with the, the red versus blue, that's um, about eight or nine uh, identically configured Hitachi SATA drives that we use for each and every test scenario. So I'm able to build vSphere, RemoteFX, uh, HDX, Zen Server, all the different hypervisors and all the different bare metal PC tests on a hot swap SATA drive. And we're able to just pop those in and out. Now, we realize that this is not your standard off-the-shelf HP, Dell, whatever hardware, and that's fine. You know, we, don't, we don't have the budget to test on that hardware, but again, we're doing one VM or one physical PC in these tests. So the fact that we're using a Core i7 processor uh, you know, with, with, uh, with, with four, four cores and that kind of stuff is more than adequate for a single VM test scenario. So I, I don't think we really need to be having uh, the high-end uh, server hardware for that. And we are using, as Benny mentioned, the uh, NVIDIA Quadro FX 3800 which is a very, very high-end uh, GPU for the testing. OK. We have one minute left. So uh, we would just want to encourage you to check out our website uh, for updates on what we're doing here. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Twitter is uh, probably better, because I'm more on Twitter than better, I am on, yeah. on the and, website uh, now. After this session, you will find us at the Absence booth uh, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, exhibition area. So, and we're happy to take your questions now. Or suggestions. Or suggestions, what we can do better, because we are thinking about what can we do with video and audio, how can we play them back, because we cannot play back audio and video in the four-up scenario. That would be weird. <laughs> and, uh, but we're thinking about how can we do it, because we want to see if all the remoting technologies are lip-synced. That is also very, very important to find out. So there are many, many stuff, uh, a lot of stuff that we can do in the future. So now, give us your best questions. And thank you for attending this session. Thanks thank you. a lot.
there? Not currently, no. We're trying to figure out a way to do that, but we have not set it up yet. But there will be the video of this session that you'll be able to see yep. them again. So it, that's all recorded here. Yeah, absolutely. You will be able to see the recording of this session, and this includes the video for ups and, and, and all what we had to say.